Chris Rock is more manly than many black professional athletes. The 57-year-old comedian is barely 150 pounds. As a child, bullies ran him out of his high school. But now he's more courageous than men who are allegedly gladiators. On Friday, Will Smith released a YouTube video apologizing to Rock for slapping him on the Oscar stage. Rock responded, responded to the apology on the comedy stage, saying, quote, if everybody claims to be a victim, then nobody will hear the real victims. Even me getting smacked by Suge Smith. I went to work the next day. I got kids. Why don't football players talk this way? Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Monday uh, to you and yours. Great to be here on this day. Uh, we have a fantastic, awesome, tremendous, spectacular show uh, planned for you today. The Korean Cosell, Steve Kim, is going to be here. The Shamok Show, Shamika Michelle, uh, she'll be here, as will Maj Ture. Maj Ture got in a beef with Matt Walsh. Uh, two of my favorite people beefing over Twitter. We'll get into that uh, towards the end of the show, their dispute. Uh, but we're going to start today talking about Chris Rock, Deshaun Watson, Warren Moon, Patrick Mah We're going to talk some football. We're going to talk some Will Smith, Chris Rock. Uh, I'm going to start a fire, and then uh, Steve Kim's going to come in and help me uh, fan the flames. All right, so uh, Halloween. That's the over-under day when a current and or former NFL player will publicly nominate Deshaun Watson for the Victimhood Hall of Fame. If I were you, <clears throat> bet the under. There are rumors that ESPN broadcaster Ryan Clark is already working on Watson's nomination speech. Insiders believe Clark could deliver the speech today now that an arbitrator hit Watson with a six-game suspension for rub and tug gate. In a 17 month span, Watson met with 20 or 66 different massage therapists. An astonishing 36% of those therapists accused Watson of sexual misconduct. It's difficult to see how Watson could be cast as the victim here. Uh, 24 women tell a similar story of Watson asking for a massage and demanding a happy ending. Uh, but reporters who regularly cover the Victimhood Olympics say Clark is one of many victimhood competitors and former players willing to use Ben Roethlisberger's 2010 suspension as justification for turning Watson into a victim. And see, if you remember in 2010, in separate incidents a year apart, uh, two women accused the then Pittsburgh quarterback of sexual assault. The NFL suspended Roethlisberger for six games before reducing that suspension to four. Big Ben is white, Watson is black. At least 15 of Watson's accusers are black. Another three are Hispanic. However, all of Watson's accusers are motivated by white supremacy, of course they are. And they're motivated by a desire to undermine successful black quarterbacks, of course they are. According to my fictional sources, Watson claims many of his black accusers were offended when he told them, this is Magnum country. The therapist thought he said MAGA country, a reference to Trump supporters. Watson was referring to his condom preference, Magnum country. Anyway, Clark isn't the only one the only candidate considering a racial defense of Deshaun Watson. Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon, someone I respect a great deal, is also reportedly contemplating making a statement on Watson's behalf. Late last week, Moon jumped to the defense of Kyler Murray, the quarterback of the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, the Arizona Cardinals lavished with a $46 million a year contract. 
The deal included a clause requiring Murray spend four hours each game week doing independent study. Moon called the clause a slap in the face to African-American quarterbacks. Listen to Moon talking to TMZ. We were always accused of back in the day when they didn't let us play is that we were lazy, that we didn't study, that we couldn't be leaders, that we weren't smart. So all those different things just kind of came to the surface uh, after we had put all that stuff to bed over the years and, and just because of this deal that's gone on between Arizona and Kyler. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the Cardinals can't incentivize and or make stipulations on Kyler Murray's work ethic because Warren Moon worked hard. Let's, let's get this. Kyler Murray isn't an individual. He's an extension of Warren Moon, Randall Cunningham, James Harris, and every other black quarterback. Now, for comparison's sake, nearly every aspect of Aaron Rodgers' personality has been analyzed and criticized. He's allegedly a narcissist. He's allegedly selfish, aloof, smug, condescending. Aaron Rodgers has won a Super Bowl and four MVP titles. He's one of the 10 greatest quarterbacks of all time. Aaron Rodgers is treated as a unique individual. Whatever happens to him is not connected to Roger Staubach, Dan Marino, Joe Montana, or even Andy Dalton or any white quarterback. This is only, this is the kind of lunacy of the victimhood ideology adopted by too many black people. Kyler Murray isn't a victim. His contract doesn't say anything about Patrick Mahomes' work ethic or Warren Moon's. The independent study clause is no different from a weight clause slapped on a consistently overweight player. But the Victimhood Olympics promotes weakness and a lack of emotional control. It baited Patrick Mahomes to cast himself as a fellow victim. An anonymous defensive coordinator questioned Mahomes' ability to read defenses. It's a common complaint leveled at many quarterbacks. Mahomes, who is half black, half white, or as I like to say, African-American insinuated the criticism is only directed at black quarterbacks. Listen for yourself. I mean, obviously, uh, the black quarterback has had a battle to be in this position that we are, to have this many guys in the league playing. And I think every day we're proving that uh, we should have been playing the whole time. We've got guys that think think uh, just as well as they can use their athleticism. And so uh, it, it always is weird when you see guys like me, Lamar, Kyler, kind of get that on them and other guys don't. But at the same time, we're going to go out there and prove ourselves every day to show that we can be some of the best quarterbacks in the league. It's very weird that a quarterback would have his intelligence question. Very weird. People, no one questions quarterbacks and their intelligence. Terry, no, no one ever said Terry Bradshaw couldn't spell cat if he spotted him the C and the A. These guys know nothing about NFL history. They don't even know about current. No one thinks Jared Goff can read a defense. He led the Rams to the Super Bowl three years ago, and everyone credited his head coach for telling him exactly what to do from the sidelines. And I'm just sorry. Mahomes, Moon, uh, Kyler Murray, anybody else whining about this? These guys are weak. Their skin is too thin for leadership. And, and I say that, and I'm telling you, I like and respect Warren Moon, but give me a break, man. Either you're built for this or you're not. Why are we putting these crutches and crippling these black quarterbacks by handing them an excuse and acting like an anonymous defensive coordinator matters. That story that Mahomes has reacted to was littered with praise of Mahomes and one person said something negative, an anonymous person. It's nothing. Tom Brady listened for two decades as people claim he was a, a product of Bill Belichick's New England system. Brady's heard broadcasters predict his de demise for the last five years. In 2016, the NFL suspended Brady for four games over deflated footballs. I've never heard Brady nail himself to a cross. 
And we have black quarterbacks whining about anonymous quotes? Have black men been that emasculated? Have we fallen into a trap where our entire identity is tied to victimhood? Who wants to be a victim? Why do we want to be victims? I don't get it. This is why I've soured on professional sports. I'm just, I'm embarrassed by what many of these black players say and how they cast themselves as victims constantly. And I can't find one of them to stand up and call this BS out. They're making millions of dollars playing a game. Criticism goes along with all of that. Bradshaw was making thousands of dollars and people were, other players were saying he couldn't spell cat. People were saying he was stupid. Are we built for this or not? Chris Rock, the comedian, is more manly than many of these black professional athletes. The 57 year old is barely 150 pounds. As a child, bullies ran him out of his high school. But now he's more courageous than men who are, are allegedly gladiators. On Friday, Will Smith released a YouTube video apologizing to Rock for slapping him on the Oscar stage. Rock responded to the apology on the comedy stage, saying reportedly, according to People Magazine, if everybody claims to be a victim, then nobody will hear the real victims. Even me getting smacked by Suge Smith. He's joking, he's comparing Will Smith to Suge Knight. I went to work the next day. I got kids. That's how you handle criticism. That's how you handle uh, your feelings getting hurt. You get back up like a man and continue to do your job. Why don't football players talk this way? Rock also added, anyone who says words hurt has never been punched in the face. Why don't football players talk this way? Sir, I, I just, I don't get it. How our entire conversation has been this emasculated that every former football player, these black ones, I'm just sorry, I gotta call, facts are facts, seem to be on TV looking for their victimhood uh, gold medal and, and passing out victimhood gold medals to everyone else. I just want you to think about this, and I texted, I, I, never mind, I don't want to, I'm not going to, but just think about this. John Gruden cracked a joke in a private email about D. Marie Smith's big lips. And D. Marie Smith, the executive director of the NFL Players Association, has really big lips. I think uh, uh, Gruden called them rubber lips. John Gruden got fired and is a pariah and has been run completely out of the NFL over a comment about DeMarie Smith's huge lips, enormous lips, in a private email. 30 women or 24 women accuse Deshaun Watson of sexual misconduct and this dude gets a six game suspension, a record contract from the Cleveland Browns. And we think we're the victims. We're running around, oh my God, an anonymous defensive coordinator said Patrick Mahomes can't read a defense. Things that have been said about quarterbacks of every color for as long as we've been playing football. And people have been, trust me on this, because I got big lips too. They're not as big as uh, Demora Smith's enormous lips, but I got big lips. People have cracked jokes about my lips. I don't whine or cry about it. Big lips are actually in style. Women love them. But John Gruden gets run out of the league and Randy Moss goes on national TV and breaks down in tears 
because in a private email, someone pointed out that D. Marie Smith has huge, enormous lips. Let me refresh your memory, Randy Moss here. We talk about leadership. We give guys these big contracts because they want to be able to lead 70 men, coaches, equipment staff, and managers to the number one goal, and that's to win a championship. And for us to be moving back and not forward in 21st century, like I said, man, National Football League, this hurts me. The clock is ticking, man. <sighs> Tech Nine, and I, you know, I don't talk a lot about rap music anymore, and I, because again, I'm not as big a fan of rap music as I used to be. But uh, Tech Nine, out of Kansas City, friend of mine, uh, had a song called Mitchell Bade. And I think about it all the time. Mitch, Mitch Bade is a play. If you switch the M and the B, the first letters of those two words, if you switch them back, it says Bitch Made. And he came up with a character called Mitch Bade. And that's what I look at and think about when I see these NFL players. Mitch Bade. And I'm sorry. And again, I'm working on being less ghetto and, and being uh, more Christ. Like I'm working really hard at it, but sometimes the, I gotta give these rap guys credit. They come up with the exact perfect explanation and I'm gonna reference it and I'm gonna use it. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but that's what I see here. Mitch Bade, all of them. This man's on national TV crying because some man in a private email to another man cracked a joke about D. Marie Smith's big lips. Something we do all the time. Not in private emails, but we play the dozens out in front of everybody. And they ran John Gruden up out of a job and out of the NFL and he's a pariah and has to live his life as if he's some kind of racist lunatic. And everybody knows that's a load of garbage. Because Mitch Bade Negroes on national TV are letting all their feminine energy out. And I know Randy Moss wants to beat me up on site. Because again, that's what Mitch Bade emotional Negroes do. They threaten to kill other black people who call them out on their BS. I, I before the week is out, or I'm betting the under, we will not make it to Halloween and someone's gonna play the race card and Deshaun Watson will be a victim of racism here, even though he's got damn near every woman he ran across says this dude whipped his Johnson out and 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 tried to get her to hop on it uh <laughs> and he, he gets a six game suspension <laughs> they got john gruden's out of the league and living as a pariah over nothing tom brady got a, a four game suspension over uh deflated footballs uh, hell hell the calvin ridley black wide receiver got, over gambling. I don't have a problem with his suspension though. Gambling gets into the integrity of the game, but anyway, uh, Steve Kim, uh, welcome uh, to the show, the Korean Cosell. Uh, Steve, I, like, I got a, a laundry list of things I wanna go over with, with you here about this, but I wanna start with the six game suspension, which Roger Goodell could lengthen if he wants to, but. Sue L. Robinson, the arbitrator here, a former judge, she's given Deshaun Watson a six-game suspension. Is the suspension too light? Well, first of all, good Monday to you, Mr. Whitlock. Uh, I think for the Cleveland Browns, uh, this is a play on words. Yes, this is a happy ending. It's not half the season. It's <laughs> short, but not too long. It's manageable. Now I guess Jacoby Brissett's going to start off the year, and hopefully he can keep them afloat uh, before the halfway mark of the 2022 season. 
Um, the way I look at this is very interesting. Everyone kind of got what they wanted. Uh, Deshaun Watson gets closure, okay? The NFL several years ago decided, you know, we got to take this player discipline thing out of our hands. We don't want to be the sole arbitrator here. So they got this judge. I guess she's like the uh, czar, the discipline czar, Sue L. Robinson. She made a determination, and now everyone gets to kind of move on here. And it is interesting when people start comparing the uh, suspensions. You're right, Tom Brady and Deshaun Watson, they have something in common. <laughs> they got both busted with uh, drain balls, right? But anyway, I'm not so sure that this is going to sewage everybody because certain people wanted a whole year. And I kind of saw that argument. But here's a fact, though, and this is a very uncomfortable fact that you're not allowed to bring up. There actually hasn't been any criminal charges levied against Deshaun Watson. I keep reading that, and, and I have to remind myself, you're right, there are allegations. A lot of them have settled the suit. So until that part is completely cleared up in a black and white where a couple women say, you know what, no, no, this is not fine. We're not taking a payoff. We are going to criminally try to take this guy to court and charge him. I'm not going to lie to you. This is not going to be popular. It does seem to me like six games without pay is fair. All right, Steve, let me tell you what you're perhaps leaving out. That his behavior, while not criminal, and let's keep in mind, Ben Roethlisberger's behavior was never deemed criminal. There was an investigation, no criminal charges brought. The first incident out in Lake Tahoe, that thing may be a total fugazi based off of a contradictory witness that blew up that woman's story. The incident in Georgia, a bit more sketchy, but no criminal charges. And so Ben Roethlisberger, for those two allegations, got suspended. The, the other thing that I think you're perhaps overlooking, and this is where Deshaun Watson deserves a suspension, the position he put the Houston Texans in, where they've had to settle lawsuits because of his behavior. That is the textbook example of conduct detrimental to the team. And his conduct put the Houston Texans in jeopardy. They had to go cut some checks. It seemed like some women hopped on board and made additional allegations just so they could get a check from the Houston Texans since they were just giving it away. It's easier for them to cut checks than to settle these things. And so he put his franchise in harm's way in a serious way, in a way that, look, Ray Carruth didn't put the Carolina Panthers in harm's way. Uh, Ray Rice didn't put uh, the Baltimore Ravens in harm's way. He, those guys did, you know, unbelievably immoral things, uh, but didn't jeopardize their franchise. Uh, Deshaun Watson put the Texans in jeopardy and cost them some money. So I, I, I do think the suspension is too light. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, I made the argument, and I know many people disagreed. Maybe last year where he didn't play was time served. Maybe that's a very spurious argument that I made. But I do think the NFL, they, they are under pressure, and, and based on what your monologue says, that if they come down and let's say they would have given him a whole season. They would have said, we don't care what happened in 2021, uh, 2022, your, your slate is not wiped clean. I do wonder, the cynic in me, are they thinking, we don't want to be branded as racist? I, I think that certainly played a part in the perception that the league wanted to avoid. Uh, that's part of the reason why Roger Goodell probably gave up control of being the sole disciplinarian of the players within his league. Look, th this this is one of those situations where no amount of punishment, either really too harsh or too light, was ever going to please everybody. That's just the reality of it. You're always going to have a faction of the populace that's going to think, no, no, that's not just. I mean, you could have suspended him for life, and that still wouldn't have pleased certain people. You could have let him go free, and that would have angered a lot of people. So. Six games, to me, I get the sense that the NFL and everyone involved here, including Sue Elbert, they hedged their bets and said, okay, where can we go right down the middle where we're going to displease the least amount of people? 
that's the reality. I think, again, the league is a corporation. They still want their stars to play. They still had a franchise to protect. And I think they believe this is the best middle ground that we could reach. Uh, if you had to guess, Steve, uh, I'll, two guesses here. Will someone uh, play the race card? And <laughs> it, it, who might that be? Who would be your leading candidate? I think uh, Vegas has uh, Bomani Jones as the heavy favorite <laughs> at minus 300. Yeah, well, Bobani Jones is always the pole position. He's the A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti of this, uh, Ryan Clark. Certainly. Actually, Jamel Hill, maybe. <laughs> Jamel Hill, yeah. I mean, that's like the Holy Trinity. I, I mean, that, really, that's Lethal Weapon 3 right there. Um, that's an interesting one. If this, You know what I find interesting on Twitter is that everyone is now trying to make Calvin Ridley into a martyr. Um, and I don't know if that's a racial thing, but they keep bringing up his suspension I want to tell these people one thing. You have to get it through your minds. Gambling is the ultimate sin. You may not like it. You may think that's not fair. It may not be as immoral as what Deshaun Watson did. But in terms of the integrity of the game in a league that is so dependent on gambling to fuel at least half of their interest, trust me. When you start doing stuff like that, you will face deep repercussions. Am I just going through my mind right now? Um, way back before I was born, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Paul Horning and Alex Karras were suspended, I believe, a whole year for having ties with gambling or actually being involved in it. Uh, Joe Namath, I remember uh, reading stories and seeing documentaries. He had a bar that he owned that was frequented by people that were in the gambling world and other people of ill repute. And I believe Pete Rosell said, you got to get rid of that bar or you're going to be gone. And I remember he did this big teary eyed press conference saying, I don't want to do it. He ended up doing it because he wanted to play football. I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for Calvin Ridley. Every player is basically told. And I think there's large signs uh, all over NFL facilities. Don't gamble. Because when you're gamble, you're going to gamble your career away. I think that's the one thing. I don't even think it's a racial issue. Is that when they start putting together these comparisons of suspensions? Now, I will say this: in terms of like marijuana suspensions, a lot of those things took place about a time or so before marijuana was really more or less legalized in a lot of jurisdictions. Our attitudes and our thought process in terms of marijuana and its usage and whether it's ethical or not, have changed. That's evolved. So I, I don't even think it's fair to list Deshaun Watson, what he got, and for a bunch of drug suspensions of Josh Gordon when it was clearly illegal throughout the country to even really possess marijuana for decades. Let's move to Kyler Murray and th that issue, the <sighs> independent study clause. And... If someone leaked it, probably Kyler Murray's camp and the Arizona Cardinals have backed off and removed it. But of course, Warren Moon, Patrick Mahomes, uh, and whoever leaked it on Kyler Murray's behalf saw that clause as racist. Do you have a problem? I, Cause I certainly don't with someone putting in a clause that, hey, you got to study this much film per week. It, it, it's no different than a weight clause that players get all the time. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I think they've turned a molehill into a mountain, or I don't even know if it was a molehill. You know, last week we did a segment on Kyler Murray when he signed that big contract. And unfortunately, by the time we taped the show and it aired, the news came out about this clause. My view is this, as a quarterback with what you get paid, if I have to put that clause in to begin with, you're not the type of guy I trust with hundreds of millions of dollars. Here I thought I was the worst guy with Korean blood with the worst study habits. It turns out it's him. And, you know, here's the thing. They put that clause in for a reason. They didn't just randomly pick out Kyler Murray out of the super lotto ball and said, okay, you're the one guy. When you are a quarterback, the franchise quarterback, you have to be the first in, last out. In other words, you got to be the first in the building, the hardest working guy, the most studious, and you have to be the last guy out. And then even when you get home, you literally have to be your own coordinator. You got to take home your own material. 
there are certain quarterbacks that have set up their own film rooms. Ray Lewis did that as a middle linebacker, as the captain of his defense. I I have an issue with Warren Moon jumping on this because there was a man of integrity and honor who went through much more as a black quarterback than any of these current quarterbacks today of any creed and color. Like I said, Warren Moon was an MVP of a Rose Bowl of a very good Washington team, had a rocket arm. This was not an option quarterback. This is a guy that played pro-style quarterback and was relegated to go into the CFL, where I believe he won five great cups before he got NFL interest. Kyler Murray, as a 5'9 player at that position, was not only the number one pick, the organization said, we're going to tailor your whole coaching staff, Cliff Kingsbury, and his style to you. And they put up with all this passive-aggressive stuff throughout the offseason. But I'm going to go back to this point. If they didn't think that they had to put the claws in, they wouldn't have put it in. But where I push back on the Cardinals is, if you had to put the claws in for that quarterback, I'm not so sure that's the quarterback that I signed for hundreds of millions of dollars. I, I, I totally agree with you that if I got to put that deal in, I'm not giving this guy $50 million a year uh, because that money is not going to improve its, his habits. It's going to accentuate the habits he already has. And, and people act like uh, – that all these different players aren't just different individuals. And so yeah. there, there may be a set of rules for Jason Whitlock uh, that may be different than for Steve Kim because we're individuals. Like, again, th this is a bad example, but I'm a stickler for showing up on time, so no mm -hmm. one has to put a clause in that says, hey, Whitlock's right. got to show up on time. But... When it comes to the dinner table, I have no discipline. And so if someone wants to put a stipulation in about me and the dinner table, I'm not going to be offended by that. I'm not going to see it as racism. I'm going to see it as, a, that's unique to me. When you're handing out this amount of money to children, this guy's 23, 24 years old. He's just a little kid. And, and we've, seen, uh, we've seen from Michael Vick to any number of players that said early in their careers when they were having success, they wish they had put more study time in. And, and so I, I just, I don't, it's almost like they want to create a situation where it's impossible to criticize, second guess any black quarterback. All you can do is worship them. And well, that's a joke. Jason, I, see, this would be a bigger story. Let's say there were four or five quarterbacks that had that study clause in their contract and they were all black. Then you could say, now, well, well, wait a minute. Now we have an issue. Now there's a clear pattern. What took place last week with the Cardinals, who's now had to rescind that clause, good luck getting the game plan to that guy, um, that says more about Kyler Murray as an individual, not the collective of black quarterbacks. But, I mean, look, there have been quarterbacks. I remember Billy Joe Holbert had a really good career at the University of Washington. He ended up being a backup, and he was with the Buffalo Bills. This is in, like, the mid to late 90s. And he came into a game so unprepared, and he admitted it after the game. Hey, I'm going to be lying. To you. I was not prepared. I didn't really study the game plan. He got cut the next week. He was a white quarterback. There's a story of Jamarcus Russell. I think it's Kirk Morrison told this story where they gave uh, Jamarcus Run Russell a DVD to study. I think blitz packages. So the coach said the next day, hey, uh, did you go over that DVD I gave you? He goes, yeah, yeah, I looked over it, looked over it. Really? You really looked over it? And I guess the DVD was blank. <laughs> so they caught him. So, look, quarterbacks are judged differently. When they're good, they are treated better than any player on that roster. They're almost treated like NBA guys in a sense that they get unbelievable money and most of it is guaranteed. But if you're bad, you're held to a microscope, and that is universal. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, you cannot literally tell me the last 25 years, has there been a double standard that has been negative towards black quarterbacks? I was disappointed to hear Patrick Mahomes whining. He's been one of my favorite players, and I've said it. Next 10 years, if I had the number one pick of any NFL player on a current roster, he'd be my number one guy. I think he's that special. But Patrick, you are not immune to criticism. In your play last year and some of the stuff you did in that championship game against the Bengals, Guess what? That's on you. 
And that is not a criticism of a black quarterback. That's a criticism of a quarterback that generally has a very high standard who simply made some very, very ill-advised plays last year, especially the one right behind halftime. But uh, I've said this again, Jason, there is a survivor's guilt where a lot of these successful athletes, they have to play the victim role or they are thought of as not being down with the cause. Mm, uh, You're 100% right there. Finally, uh, Chris Rock versus Will Smith. Uh, Chris Rock, I'm, 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 I had high thoughts of Chris Rock, but I, not this high. I was to hear him (laughs) call out this victim culture and say, look, man, I went to work the next day. Uh, I love that. Are you, are you surprised, impressed by how Chris Rock has handled, uh, the Oscar smack? And this has been going on what now for three or four months. I, you know, he, he just stuck the landing here, uh, his response to Will Smith's apology. I love it because he's being a man. It's like, look, I got work to do. I, I don't have time to lick my wounds and cry and time's not running or time's running out. <laughs> By the way, you played that Randy Moss clip again? <laughs> On site again, Whitlock. On site. But anyway, um, <laughs> comedians are really good at being self-deprecating. In fact, the best comedians, in my view, can make fun of themselves and turn a situation where the onus is on them and turn it into something very positive and funny. And I love the way Chris Rock did that. By the way, I better not hear any credit about Will Smith apologizing because in the immortal words of Chris Rock, you did what you're supposed to. Okay, he fed his kids, he got a job, he stayed out of jail. What do you want, a cookie? So, yes, Chris Rock gets a thumbs up. Will Smith, you did what you're supposed to. Did you like the apology? Do you think it was sincere, <laughs> authentic? Um, my view is this. If it was really sincere, why not just have a man-to-man, face-to-face, personal interaction? Why not meet them somewhere, set something up where they could shake hands, hug it out, dap each other? Uh, but to make that a big social media... Oh, I media- think Will Smith would love that. But Chris Rock's not giving him that stage right now. Okay. Well, that, that's fair. And that, that's fair. I don't um, – did I like the apology? I mean, I didn't hate it. But Will Smith has become a real puppet in a lot of ways. I used to admire him. I did. I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to know uh, when he was doing albums with Jazzy Jeff and parents just don't understand. I actually have the album still. I, and I used to like him because he never tried to be anything – that he wasn't. He was a kid from Philly, but he wasn't Schooly D. His like his even even his style of rap really represented something that was true and authentic to himself. He was not a gangbanger. He didn't do drive-bys. He was a kind of a suburban kid that had a nice upbringing, very entertaining. Now I I just think he's so immersed in this fake Hollywood world. Everything he does, I, I feel as though it's like the puppet masters controlling him. Jada's controlling. Thank you, Steve. Good job. Awesome. We'll see you later in the week. Uh, With the recent rulings from the Supreme Court, it's worth mentioning that these wins didn't happen on their own. It took the support of companies like Patriot Mobile, who have passionately fought on behalf of the unborn and your constitutional rights. Patriot Mobile is America's only Christian conservative mobile phone provider, and they have been on the front lines fighting for your values. This is why Patriot Mobile is different from every other provider out there. Inflation has hurt many Americans, but thankfully, Patriot Mobile has plans for almost any budget and they offer the same nationwide coverage as all the major carriers. So you get the same great service plus the knowledge that your money is going to a company fighting for the sanctity of life, religious freedom, and the Second Amendment. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Jason or call 972-PATRIOT. Use the offer code Jason to get free activation. If you're a veteran or first responder, please let them know because they have special discounts just for you. Come join our movement and make the switch today. PatriotMobile.com slash Jason, PatriotMobile.com slash Jason, or call 972-PATRIOT. All right, Shamika Michelle, we'll get her thoughts on Will Smith and Chris Rock next. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's roll out to North Carolina, bring in Shamika Michelle. 
uh, for my favorite part of the show. Shamika, uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that uh, Will Smith, what's it been, three months since he slapped Chris Rock, maybe four, uh, has taken to YouTube uh, to issue an apology. And uh, he says that he reached out to Chris Rock. Chris Rock's not ready to meet right now. But b before we get your comments, I want to play three different clips from Will Smith's apology. It was a little less than six minutes. I think we'll play about three minutes all together of what he had to say. But let, let's play these three clips back to back and then uh, we'll bring Shamika back in, get her take and I'll give mine. I spent the last three months um, replaying and understanding the nuances and, and the complexities of what happened in, in that moment. Um, and I'm not gonna try to unpack all of that right now, but I can say to all of you, there is no part of me that thinks that was the right way to behave in that moment. There's no part of me that thinks that's the optimal way to handle a feeling of disrespect or, or insults. So there's two things. One, um, disappointing people is my central trauma. Um, I hate when I let people down. Um, so it, it hurts. Uh, it hurts me psychologically and emotionally to know I didn't live up to uh, people's image and impression of me. And the work I'm trying to do is I am deeply remorseful and I'm trying to be remorseful without being ashamed of myself, right? I'm human and I made a mistake and I'm trying not to think of myself as a piece of shit. Um, so I would say to those people, I know it was confusing. I know it was shocking. Um, but I, I promise you, I am uh, deeply devoted and committed to putting light and love and joy into the world. And, you know, if you, if you hang on, I promise we'll be able to be friends again. I've reached out to Chris um, and the, mes the message that came back is that uh, he's not ready to talk. And when he is, he will reach out. Um, so I will, I will say to you, um, Chris, I apologize to you. Uh, my behavior was unacceptable, and I'm here whenever you're ready to talk. All right, so uh, that's Will Smith in a very choreographed uh, YouTube video. I think there seem to be two or three different camera angles. Uh, I, before I, and so he was responding to questions or the appearance that people ask questions. And so he, he gave three or four different responses to questions that he read out loud that seemed to pretend like someone had asked these things specifically. And so uh, first and foremost, just your overall thoughts, did Will Smith do himself any favors? Did he improve your perception of him with this apology? No, he didn't. When I first watched it, Jason, I wanted to go and borrow someone's balls so that I could ship them to him FedEx. That was my initial thought. I just thought the production of it was too much. If I'm sincerely apologizing to someone, I'm just talking to them. I didn't understand why he needed the, the different camera angles and all of this production. Who says, you know, I, I'm really hard felt, you know, I really sincerely apologize, but I want to say to you that, and then to the, 
that was too much. It was too much for me. But because my daughter told me last week that I'm I'm not empathetic, I'm blunt. And I said to her, you can't be empathetic and blunt. And she said, well, people can, but you can't. I'm trying to tap into my empathetic side because I thought I was an empath. So um, here I go, Jason. When it comes to him saying that disappointing people was his central trauma, I understood that because I've seen it so much. Like one of my closest friends has this whole good guy image. And although his actions don't always line up, his desires don't always line up, he tries to do whatever he can to uphold this image. And I think what happens with that is that you have to uphold lies in order to uphold an image of being perfect. And this is why I feel like Will went to the lengths and the extent that he did to do this video because he's still trying to have this good guy image. Yes, you made a mistake. Yes, it was wrong. Say that and leave it alone. But this whole I'm trying to be remorseful without being ashamed of myself, it just came across very victimy and as if he doesn't know how to separate doing something bad or doing a wrong thing from being a bad person. And most people understand that. The fact that Will doesn't says to me he needs some extensive counseling. He needs time away from his wife who seems to have really beat him down over the years. And he needs a group of masculine men to su surround him and help pull him from this space because he looked very neutered. And no, it did nothing for me to change my perception of him at all. I I'm going to summarize what you said my way very soon. he needs Jesus that that literally is what I was thinking watching this because and you picked up on the things that, that bothered me he's I'm sorry that I hurt people's uh, hurt people's expectations of me or uh, didn't live up to people's expectations of me and I'm like well hold on you living for the wrong reason you sitting around trying to worry about what people think of you and trying to please them. And if, if someone needs to shake will and say, hey, man, develop a relationship with God and, and try to obey and please him. And you would quit worrying about living up to people's expectations. You'd never make this mistake that okay. you made, because once you're in the mindset of well, I'm, my purpose here is to serve God and to please him. It, don't, it won't matter what joke Chris Rock cracks. Chris Rock is not your God. He is not in control of your emotions or happiness in any way. Neither any of these other outside people. That Your, your happiness comes through pleasing, obeying God. So that, that was one thing. And then he said, uh, again, I was reminded of again, when he said, I'm deeply remorseful ashamed of myself and don't want to see myself as a piece of shit. And so there's nobody in a relationship with God that would see themselves as a piece of doo-doo that would uh, be that ashamed of themselves because they know they were made in God's image. They're in a relationship with God. And so I just see a guy that, because again, based off what he has said about his own upbringing, he used to have a relationship with God and he no longer does. Hollywood has completely turned him out. I'm not just going to put that on Jada. She's part of the Hollywood machine. And there's, you know, I'm not going to put that. that. That's Hollywood and living out in L.A. and, and just divorcing yourself from all the values that you grew up with, that's how you end up in the position Will Smith is in, where he's on YouTube looking very emasculated, no confidence in himself, despite, you know, he's had all this success, but you know, no confidence in himself. That dude needs to rediscover his relationship with God because again, I, I just kept looking for some deeper understanding 
of what's going on with him and what's going to, and if you remember, didn't he reference, Denzel Washington talked to him that night and he mm-hmm. quoted what Denzel told him and all of that, all of that has gone over his head because Denzel made a, a religious analogy and you know how the devil will get you at your highest moment. None of that has connected with Will. He, he yeah. doesn't understand that there's a satanic spirit out there in Hollywood that has total control of him. Uh, and so I, 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 I was more disappointed. I, I was disappointed and, and didn't leave that video, six minute video, hopeful. He doesn't seem to be moving any closer uh, to resolution and, and a better yeah. place. Uh, I did, on the other hand, I'm, I'm completely impressed with Chris Rock and a bit surprised that he's handling this as well as, as he is. He's actually winning big time through this. Uh, you know, he, he, he looks real from a, a kid that was bullied in high school and run out of his high school by white bullies. Here, here this dude is 57 years old. He looks more manly than anybody. And, and I look at people at the, at the time when he didn't physically react to being smacked, I think people initially was like, oh, that's weak. I would have defended myself. I would have, instead, that man kept doing his job and was like, I'm gonna let Will Smith continue to make a fool out of himself. And I'm gonna stand here like nothing happened. And I'm gonna continue to do my job and take care of my, and I'm t- three months later, this dude looks like one of the strongest men on the planet. Yeah, I'm actually, I, I, I appreciate the way he handled it. Of course, initially that night, I thought he did a great job as well. Now, for me, they would have had to cut to an extended commercial. But I think that Chris Rock did a fabulous job. And I think that's one of the things I always talk about. I think bullying as a child is not as bad as people have, have made it out to be. I was bullied and I've seen Chris really handle things appropriately online. He's had so many people talk about him from young people to a 96 year old lady who was claiming that he was soft for not hitting Will back, yet it hasn't faced him at all. And so I think when you deal with bullying as a child or when you have to deal with things in real life, it makes handling stuff online that that aren't really real a lot easier. And I'm super impressed with the way Chris Rock has responded and I'm even okay with him not being ready to talk yet. So I I think he's done a great job in handling this. I tell people all the time and and Chris is like a living example. He's living it out. And I I hope that if I were ever put in that situation, I could handle it as well as him. But again, I, I say to people all the time, your behavior does not dictate my behavior. And so just because Will Smith acted a fool Oscars night, that doesn't mean I have to act a fool right along with him. And, and that's, I, I see people, oh, if someone gets loud and curses at you or whatever, you need to get loud and curse about, like, I'm gonna let that person make a fool out of themselves. And it, it, it's my whole, if someone calls me fat or someone, someone calls me the N word, that makes, the, and I'm talking about black or white, that makes mm-hmm. them look foolish, not me. And so I don't get my emotions wrapped up and caught up in that, and I don't give them the same energy they're trying to give me. I'm in control of my emotions. Chris Rock living it out. Uh, I, I, hats off to Chris Rock. I, I, he, he, he's shocking me here, and I hope that one day I'm as uh, strong and as brave as him. Uh, let's get to our approval rating of uh, Chris Rock. Uh, This will be very interesting. I I find it very hard to be critical of anything uh, with Chris Rock. Uh, Love him as a comedian, although he doesn't crack my all-time top three, uh, but I do love him as a comedian. Uh, And so I gave him a 23 in job performance. Uh, you know, he's not quite Eddie Murphy or Eddie Murphy in his heyday, not quite Richard Pryor, uh, but he's very good. And so I gave him a 23 in job performance. 
I gave him a 22. I think he's a really good comedian. And also, I think he did a good job at the Oscars, even, you know, in the midst of what was happening. He handled himself very well. I just didn't give him like a 24 or a 25 because no one is perfect. And like you, he's not like my top favorite comedian, but I think he job performance, he has it pretty well down pat. Uh, character, uh, I couldn't give him a perfect score, although I wanted to. Uh, he blew up his marriage, and it was his fault. Uh, he said porn got a hold of him, and, <laughs> and that kind of destroyed and undermined his marriage. So I gave him a 24 in character. I gave him a 23. You know, people have been coming at him for his movie, Good Hair, and saying that he was trying to put black women down. I never thought that. I felt like his character and the reason for him doing the movie was really to help black women. So I think he's a good person. I like him for that. And for that, he gets 23, which is the GOAT number again for me. So that's why I gave it to him. <laughs> Uh, authenticity, uh, you know, I love where Chris is at now with these particular comments. You know, I think he's had a couple of woke moments uh, previously. So uh, I think this is my lowest score. I gave him a 20 in authenticity. I gave him a 24 just because I think that he's very genuine. I think he is who he presents himself to be. And I think the way that he's handled this whole debacle has really shown us that he's a really genuinely kind person. And so I gave him a 24, which is the highest score for me. Uh, it factor. He's all over the news now. He's revitalized his career. But I once met Chris at a, of all places, at a Kansas City Royals baseball game. And uh, I would, the number one takeaway in meeting him and shaking his hand, I thought maybe at the time he was the smallest grown person, man, I had ever met. If this dude weighs 150 pounds, I'd be shocked. Uh, and so I can't, he probably wouldn't be <clears throat> every woman's cup of tea at that, because he might be lighter than some of the women <laughs> he dates. Uh, so I gave him a 21 in it factor. I gave him a 19, Jason, and I gave him a 19 because he hasn't been as funny to me with his new teeth. Like the teeth he had and when he did Pookie and when he first stand, uh, started stand up, he was funnier. He got those new teeth and I feel like he got a new attitude and he just hasn't been as funny. So when it comes to his it factor, I had to take a few points off for the new teeth. They look good, but the, the jokes aren't as funny coming through them. Mm. All right. Uh, shockingly, we both came to the same score in 88. Chris Rock, a smoke show. Uh, so there you have it. All right. Thank you, Shamika. Uh, let me tell you guys, the Blaze Patriotic Sock Packs are back. At the end of last year, we released a limited supply of Let's Go Brandon socks so you could wear your patriotism wherever you want it. They were comfortable, stylish, and best of all, worth a laugh. Well, you spoke and we listened. So, back by popular demand, we have new limited edition socks just in time for the primaries and back to school shopping. There are two sock packages and stylish drink covers to keep your beverages cool and patriotic. If you can't decide which package to choose from, <laughs> remember this is America. You can always get both. If you buy both sock packages, we'll throw in a free bonus set of socks and an additional set of drink covers with a discount off the full purchase price. Hurry though, these are limited edition. Get them now at blazesocks.com before they're gone. For our Blaze TV subscribers, we wanna thank you for your continued support. So we're sweetening the pot. Use promo code BLAZESUB for 20% off your purchase. That code is only available to Blaze TV subscribers. You must use the email address associated with your Blaze TV subscription to snag this discount. Not a subscriber? No problem. Subscribe to Blaze TV now and use promo code FEARLESSSOCKS to save on both your Blaze TV subscription and get 20% off these limited edition socks. Go to blazesocks.com to scope out the socks, get a pair for a deserving dad, a grad, or that person who needs a new pair of socks 
and a good laugh. All right, Maj Ture, he's in a war with Matt Walsh. We'll talk with Maj. X. All right, welcome back. Uh, let me take a moment to set up uh, this discussion I'm going to have with Maj Ture uh, about his beef with Matt Walsh. I just want to read a couple of tweets. One, here's the original tweet uh, from Matt Walsh that kind of sparked this uh, beef. Uh, Matt Walsh tweeted on July 30th, I believe that's Saturday, uh, well over one million whites were enslaved in North Africa between the 16th and 19th centuries, most of them abducted and sold by Muslim pirates. Africans were raiding Europe for slaves for hundreds of years. The school system has totally erased this fact from history. Uh, Matt then goes on, there's a series of tweets from Matt, all you know, for, further expounding on the slave trade and some historical facts. Uh, Maz jumps in uh, uh, with his response to Matt's original tweet, dumb, reductive, and horrible attempt at justifying the transatlantic slave trade takes uh, take here. Conservatives love going full retard and damaging any inroads into black communities with these kind of takes. I just bigged up, big up dude for what is a woman film and then this laughing emojis. Uh, then they go back and forth and, and debate and, and next thing I see Maj has a video uh, where he further elaborates. And so I'm sitting at home like, dang, these are two of my favorite follows on Twitter and, and, and they're beefing back and forth. And so I was like, well, we'll have Maj on the show. Uh, to explain at least his half of the beef. I, I do want to uh, enter into this discussion. Uh, Maj, I don't know if you know this, but I, I liked What is a Woman, but yeah. I was critical of What is a Woman and had Matt Walsh on this show and told him what my criticisms were uh, to his face. And so I'm a big fan and supporter of Matt yeah. Walsh, but I'm not remotely shy about criticizing anything or anybody. Uh, yeah. And so let me start here. I didn't get why you were so strongly going after Matt Walsh for this tweet or his series of tweets. And so uh, help me understand. So first, um, I, I, I did like what is a woman. Um, I think Matt is usually spot on on certain things. It's, it's, it's similar to a lot of um, conservatives. I'm very critical. It's almost like if we're going into the tactic room, right? What does this actually prove? I just did an interview um, and you know, we discussed, a guy said, well, you know, what would be wrong with All Lives Matter? And I'm like, well, there's nothing technically wrong with it. If you thought that, you should have said it before BLM said Black Lives Matter. It's just what it is. And everybody knows, I don't really bang with BLM as an organization, but the phrase and the redact re redactive, you know, reductive component. And let, let me be clear. If we're trying to make inroads into black communities, these types of takes that have nothing to do with anything kind of like just gives extreme leftists more of a tool to utilize against us. And what I mean by that is if I'm a person in the middle, let's say I'm a Democrat and I'm not the extreme lefty, I think a lot of these guys are making moves that are in re uh, like reactionary to what extreme lefties do. That doesn't advance conservative movements to people that may be in the middle in a democratic city. So we say a thing and then an extreme leftist packages it and says, see, they're minimizing your ability or the, the, the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, Matt may have not been trying to do that. I'm talking about from a tactical and strategic standpoint. The left dominates urban and black America because they understand PR and messaging way better than the right does. Simple and plain. They have to because they don't have many facts. Sorry, they just don't. So they have to be very good at smoking mirrors and lying in PR because that's what a lot of public relations or perception and reality is. This, and, and I think maybe Matt's following, maybe took it a little too, you know, they got a little sensitive about it, but it's always one step in the right direction with a lot of conservatives. And then we say something that makes the job of my job a lot more difficult because it's like, damn, that sounds like you're trying to downplay the role. And that's what every extreme leftist is going to do. 
Then there's a, the com- combination of all of these other things, all of these other statements, all of the, you know, you got the uh, Tatum saying, you know, pretty much every black dude that gets shot by the police deserves it. And I'm critical of being dumb, but I'm also also critical of the state. And so from a strategic and tactical standpoint, this does not spread conservative values or make the job better. We keep going with this facts don't care about your feelings concept. And how has that been working out for us by not expressing any type of empathy first? Empathy first. If a person hears something like that, and if a leftist gets in their ear and they say they don't care about you and your, or your people or your lineage struggle, they don't care about the fact that redlining is a thing that still impacts black communities right now. They don't care that uh, 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 school choice is partially not a thing because the state, they don't care. They'll utilize that as ammo. So that's kind of like what my pushback was. But I still think the movie was cool. I still think Matt has a glorious beard. And, you know, that's just that. And so... I think I want to now kind of, if possible, I, I may be wrong as a tactic for this discussion, kind of push uh, Matt off to the side and just say, from my perspective, and, and want to know, ha- have we lathered ourselves perhaps with too much empathy mm. and not enough truth? And so... I'm trying to say leave Matt out of it, but I guess I can't because one, I think the truth he's trying to get at is like, hey, look, I know that black people have this obsession with slavery, but the reality is slavery was a global phenomenon and the particularly back in that time, if you go back to the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, the whole world was built around conquest, subjugation, and domination. That's Mm -hmm. what men all over the globe did to each other. And Mm -hmm. and, and we need to evaluate uh, what was going on in America during that time frame in the context of what was going on across the globe. Mm -hmm. Because domination, subjugation, imposing your will before all these technological advances where now again you don't a king doesn't need someone to carry him across the land on a, he hops in a car in a, or yep. hops on a plane or right. and so it's less important to dominate and subjugate other human beings because we've made all these technological advances yep. if we rolled the clock back and took all these technological advances away Subjugation, domination, and slavery would be come back in vogue globally again. And I, I think he was, and again, Twitter is not a good environment for unpacking deep, nuanced thoughts. It's not even a good platform for truth, in my opinion. And yeah. so I think he's chosen the wrong platform. One of his defenses was, hey, I'm just repeating what Thomas Sowell said. What Thomas Sowell said in a book or a newspaper where you can unpack, unpacking it over Twitter leads to misunderstanding and the kind of back and forth you and him had. Your, your reaction to any of that? I think there's two, a, a few things to unpack there. One, we gotta stop pretending like, um, I, I don't live in all of these other parts of the world. You know, we keep, a lot of conservatives and libertarians tend to go, well, it was happening everywhere else, so it was cool. That's diminishing. I would never tell my Jewish brothers and sisters like, yo, the Holocaust, cool. I mean, Genghis Khan killed how many people? I mean, he got you guys beat by how many million? It's reductive. It's dismissive. And that does. And and, and no one would say it. I would never say to an American, just forget about 9-11. Get over it. It, Tragedies, buildings fall down every day, B. It just happened in Miami. Miami, you know, you guys, it, there was way more people that died in 9-11 than that building that fell in Miami last year. It's reductive. If I got breast cancer, or I'm going to a breast cancer scenario, and I'm saying, oh, my, my wife has breast cancer, and I smoke cigars, and I show up, you know, somebody shows up talking about, well, what about lung cancer? Lung cancer is a thing. It's, it's stupid, and it doesn't move the actual thing forward. That's the point that I'm talking about. We have to, there's a difference between whether you are trying to advance conservatism, and that truth can still be the truth, 
The question becomes, what is your actual outcome here? Is your outcome here to just get things riled up so you can get the base that already agrees with you to buy more stuff or watch the movie? Right now, we're doing content on it. This is going to be you know, beneficial for Matt. It's going to be beneficial for me. If that's the goal, then state that goal. My goal is I want an actual win. I want to spread conservative and libertarian values where it's needed the most, and I do not want to give our opposition more ammo to make it more difficult to do that. Presenting the truth and saying, here's a better way of saying that. Slavery absolutely was a global phenomenon. Sidebar for a second. I hate when conservatives rush to Thomas Sowell Thomas Sowell is an economist, and I'm not knocking that, and he's a genius in that lane, but there are far more voices that are better equipped to have that conversation. These guys will say these things about history and slavery, don't even know who John Henry Clark is, have, have read nothing by the great Walter E. Williams, another Philly cat, but they'll run the South, so, but that's a bit of a sidebar. The, the reality Let is- Let me stop you there point. for one second. Let me stop you there, and, yeah. and I'm someone uh, let's say 15 years ago, was very critical of Thomas Sowell. Yeah. Uh, but but I do want to just introduce this. For, he's not just an economist. He, he oh, is absolutely. one of the absolutely. great historians. He's one absolutely. of the great historians in America. So I just want to inject yeah. that. Let, so let, me be, let me be very clear for the, and res give respect to the OG. There, there's in no way, shape, or form. I don't want that because I don't want it. That could sound diminishing or reductive of the greatness that he's presented. Let me be clear about that. But I, but I also want people to pick up other historians and not just go to that one in that space. And here's a better way of saying that in a more nuanced way. Slavery has been a global phenomenon. Here in America, where extreme leftists try to attempt to present all white men as being responsible for slavery currently, which we know is not true, there has still been ills on our nation's flag because even though we attempted and uh, ascribed to end it, we participated in an ugly ill that has impacted the lineage and not even just when slavery ended. Again, here's a great book. These books are still here, The Color of Law. Again, Jewish dude. This is something that currently, when segregation, Jim Crow, after emancipation, there were hundreds of years of race-based impact that impacted black communities. The war on drugs, gun control. These were created to stop black people. Medical apartheid. These weren't things that just, be just because these people um, don't have as much power. These were race-based things. And I think there's a uniqueness there that we can acknowledge from a balanced perspective without attempting to or coming off as we're diminishing that struggle, because even right now, even right now, again, the color of law, there's a reason why we're struggling in black communities with school choice, because of segregation. This is the actual format of how governmental bodies use race-based ideology to keep black people out of certain things. That happened, that happened. That does not mean, also, that does not mean that I'm lining up with the lefties saying, we can't make it because the system was against us and whoop de whoop whoop. There's a balanced approach there that I think that guys like Matt at certain times, guys like Brandon Tatum, a lot of times, just go with the thing that's gonna appease their base because they're not thinking about advancing the cause of conservatism to your question of, are we talking about just coddling with empathy and truth? I think it needs to be both. I think that when you use empathy first, and then get into the facts, and then go into solutions that all Americans can start to apply, then we make you know, more headway and we gain g greater ground. I do not see the, the, the importance of that strategy other than to have a bunch of, if you've read the, even the thread, these guys are talking about, yeah, I'm white, I didn't do nothing to nobody. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. That's not even what the conversation of reparations is even about. The conversation of reparations, God, God bless the dead to uh, Johnny Cochran, he had a thing called the Reparations Assessment Group, where he was gonna go after current existing corporations that benefited from the slave trade on black people in America. Corporations that have charters that still exist, like Wells Fargo, like uh, Southern, the, the train company, right? Norfolk Southern, that's the name of that company. So even the argument about 
we got to make sure that slavery is shown to be something that happened globally because we don't want the extreme leftists to start having a conversation about reparations. Never mind the fact that Japanese Americans have from the internment camps and their lineage have received reparations. Never mind the fact that the indigenous people have received a form of reparations. We can't even have this conversation when it comes to black people. They're so afraid of that conversation that they don't even understand what reparations and what that would look like. And what I mean by that is targeting companies. There's no statue of limitations on murder or kidnapping. There's no statue of limitations on that. So I think that there needs to be a broader understanding and stop listening to extreme lefties who are presenting something that don't speak for black people. They just speak up on top of black people. This all comes out of a overcorrection, trying to, since the extreme lefties are saying this, we're going to be extreme on this side. And there's black people, conservative people that want to address black issues that want to hardworking, want to make our communities better, that we're alienating with these extreme statements, even if it is only trapped in 160 characters. We have to make better choices with our pen and our actions. Are we actually trying to move the conservative movement forward where we need it? We can't say, well, we're not catering to a base. Well, if you thought about that, then you wouldn't cater to conservative base. If you say, well, it shouldn't be about race. Well, we wouldn't support blacks for Trump. There wouldn't be an organization called Blexit, the black exit from the Democratic Party. We know we need black people to come more onto conservative, independent and libertarian ideology. The question we have to ask ourselves is, especially guys with big platforms, is this move that I'm about to make, is this gonna advance the cause? Or even before that question, do I actually wanna advance the cause? And if I do wanna advance the cause, is this move I'm about to make, am I giving ammo to leftists that are gonna utilize that to paint it to regular, not so informed people in democratic cities as look, this Matt Walsh guy doesn't care about your elder struggle. We would never say anything about that about the Jewish community. We wouldn't, we wouldn't tweet it, we wouldn't type it, it's not okay. It is not a good strategy, it's just not. And so those were the things that I was kind of giving pushback for. And I, I put those books up there because I don't want, I also don't want people to have this thought process that I'm operating off this emo space of like, oh, he's black American, so he's just triggered by it. No, I got studies about the history of the Arabs who actually started the slave trade in Africa. But people should be studying Ivan Van Sertima. They should be studying Sheikh Antijoup. They should be studying Anthony Browder. They should be studying the great John Henry Clark just as much as we study Thomas Saud, uh, 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 Walter Williams, all of these other great minds, freedmen, you know, who's obviously these guys, their home base is economy, uh, uh, economics, but they their minds are great. But there's other great minds before we start making these blunders that make it more difficult for people that may be on the middle to hear us because absolutely leftists are going to weaponize everything that we tweet. And if it look crazy to people in the hood, it's like, eh, I don't know, bro. It makes the job more difficult. So that's what my pushback was. Maj, and I'm going to make an analogy here that I think puts you in a good light, but you'll be the judge of that. Uh, have you considered that perhaps you and Matt Walsh have two separate agendas. And so as I'm listening to you talk, one of the first thoughts that ran through my head was, Maz Torre wants to be a modern day Harriet Tubman. He wants to deliver black people from a mindset that has them trapped and enslaved. And so Harriet Tubman had one job, she's out trying to deliver black people to freedom. And that's yeah. what I hear from you, is you're trying to give black people the room and the space to have independent free thought like every other ethnic group on the planet has that we don't seem to have. Mm -hmm. Whereas Matt Walsh, my, his agenda, and, and I don't know fully, I, I don't know, I haven't talked to him, I don't know. His agenda might be uh, that he's trying to give white people the courage because the slavery issue and the way the left has used it, mm -hmm. and again, I don't know if you have any religious beliefs, I don't wanna pin those on you if you don't have them, but for someone like me that does, 
I'm watching the left use the slavery issue to discredit Christianity and a biblical worldview. And mm -hmm. so he's trying to, I think, and again, I don't know, but if I were him and I was tweeting that stuff out, it would be about trying to say, hey, look, don't let the issue of slavery be the justification for walking away from your biblical worldview or Christian mm. values. Mm. And so I'm trying to give you that. I'm trying to give, and Matt Walsh is following, I imagine is 99% white. He's trying to give white men the courage, stand on your biblical values, don't let them tell you that slavery discounts Christianity and what the founders and the founding documents. And so what I see, and when I was reading, I was like, these are two people with two different agendas. Both of them are agendas that I can support. Freeing black people from a mindset that has clearly not served us well. We've bought into every liberal ideology. We, we think that, hey, let's destroy the family. Let's buy, buy into the matriarchy. Yeah. And, and again, one of the reasons why I like having you on the show, love what you represent, because you're clearly very intelligent and well-read, but again, you're a man with some real masculine energy trying to tell everyone, hey, let's don't run away from this male leadership. Yeah. And so I see your agenda, and I see his agenda. I don't, and I just would be careful about applying your goals he may have a different set of goals that uh, aren't really at cross purpose with yours. Here's here's where I think I can see that absolutely. Um, and again, I I, I want to be clear because people are like, oh, this is a beef. It, you know what I mean? It's like, listen, it's not beef. That word means something. Um, <laughs> where I'm from, this is anyone that is doing a thing that makes it harder for me to free minds is in the way. And if you have a large following, I'm going to be critical of the decisions that you make and the things that you put out that makes that job more difficult for me. Because I get that phone call. I go, again, not to keep harping, but there's, there's, there's guys that, you know, that just bootlick. And I'm saying conservative values as a libertarian. One, my libertarian friends give me pushback because they're like, bro, you know conservatives are just liberals going to speed limit. It's just like, come on, bro. But I'm like, yo, there's conservative values of being pious and being humble and being fiscally conservative, limited government. There's overlap between the libertarians and the conservative ideology there on those points. My point, though, is I get that phone call. Yo, bro, you talking about conservative main man just said uh, uh, Tamir Rice or, 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 or insert whichever one. They deserved it, you know. And I'm already battling against, you know, the the the, the George Floyd conversation. It's like, nah, I, there's a I am a tactician. This is a chess board. And whoever gets people more in the middle, they win. You already have the people that's on your side. There's no point when, when we started with Black Guns Matter, we got a bunch of people telling us we shouldn't go to anti-gun places. People tell me all the time I shouldn't carry a gun in anti-gun cities. I do it. I go there. That's where we need it the most. So when someone does things that I get them phone calls about, like, bro, I can't get down with that ideology. I used to get the same phone calls about the libertarians. Like, yo, bro, y'all, y'all, the head of the libertarian party is a clown. That's why we worked with the Mises caucus to get rid of him, to get rid of those people and get this thing back onto liberty. Now we can bring black people into the conservative space. That's the reason why I made that huge panel uh, at CPAC a few years with all of these black conservative voices. The goal is to free those minds. Anything that is in the way of that, I'm going to be critical of. And 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 I'm not apologizing for me being aggressive. It's and, and I don't even think I was that aggressive. I was like laughing. I'm like, yo, I do think Matt Walsh has an amazing beard. Like, is this just what it is? You know, I got this section of my beard. I got stabbed in the face. It, it won't even grow back right. You know, I do think that the movie was great. I do think he has some good takes, but him take Matt Walsh out, just like a lot of other conservatives, there becomes a time where they start to placate to their base. You placate to the base and that that, that base already agrees with you. And it's 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 
a massive overcorrection for what the so-called leadership on the left is doing. They are not the rank and file. Most law enforcement officers, most, are not the brass, are not the rank and file. Most law enforcement officers are not going outside going, yeah, let me smack up some black people today. Most of them are not. However, we have to acknowledge that some are, and the ones that are, we have to call them out. And if you're a person that's on the conservative side and you've submitted totally to this back to blue no matter what, and a reactionary to uh, all of the police are horrible from the extreme left, you're just doing an extreme thing that is not balanced. That is not conservative, that is extreme. And so I have to question, why are you doing that? You're a smart dude, Matt, you understand, you know other guys may not be as smart, but why are you doing this? Is the strategy just to just to say stuff? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't talk about, you know. Uh, I'm, my, I'm gonna go I, back to again, I'm gonna go back to again, and I, I your position makes total sense because your mission is really to expand your base and following and recruit people to your way of thinking. It's not out of some selfish, it's just like, look, this, my way of thinking actually works and will have you not be dependent on white people for your success. You'll actually be in control of your destiny. You're trying to expand that base. I would think Matt Walsh he's less motivated by trying to expand his base as much as he's motivated by trying to inspire his base to stand on their values when it really matters. That's a bad, that's a, that's not, that's a, that's a less productive tactic to win. That's a great tactic for sales and, or, and again, inspiring. Okay. We, we are inspiring the base. Trump did that. And look what happened. We didn't expand the base. They cheated better. They got more bodies. They did a thing. They didn't expand. This thing, again, you can be in your silo, and that's cool. That only works as a productive measure compared to how effective or ineffective the left is at expanding theirs and taking your stuff. So if we can convince two Republicans to be in support of H.R. 1808 and it gets through Senate, which is some draconian, racist, unconstitutional mandates that are not in alignment with the Second Amendment, the Democrats expand it and took a step further to win. Now, it may not get passed in the Senate. It may or maybe there'll be another Republican that feels like he needs to capitulate because the Democrats are expanding newer, younger minds. The people that already agree with you need to become force multipliers for the cause. The Democrats understand it. AOC understand that very well, very well. So even I, if that's- I, the, I, I would bet, I would, I, would, I would argue, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I would argue that somebody would make the argument, well, Democrats ain't really expanding. They're importing, that's why they're illegal immigrants, they're mm -hmm. importing a base, mm -hmm. uh, and they're promoting uh, LGBTQ plus alphabet mafia values, yep. and that's a way to expand their base. The more kids they can get to go LGBTQ, the more think they'll, they'll have a Democratic following. But, yep. but again, they're, they're doing, in my view, unethical things to expand their base because their message actually falls flat and doesn't work with most rational people. They, however they being immoral and, and repugnant about it, their focus is expansion. Their focus is expansion. Okay, what's, what's the counter? We on a chessboard, bro. If we on a chessboard and they make a move, what's your move, bro? This is this is this is competition. I want to win. I want to save the republic. That's what I want to do. They're gonna cheat. We that means we gotta work triple and double, double and triple time if we're gonna maintain our ethics and morals to do it. So every move counts. So if there's over 40 million undecided voters, 40 million, I need 10 of them. 
I need 10 million of them. How can we get our message to that demographic and make them understand that this is a better way and then get them politically aligned? We don't do that by uh, uh, creating space that repulse, that gives the ammo to the other side, that repulses it. For me, for example, as a libertarian, I don't care if you're gay or bisexual. If you ask me a moral question, I'll say, well, what's your moral system? Well, I'm Christian. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed, bro. I don't know if you, you might be contradictory on that. I'll, act, I'll have a moral conversation with you from a respectable and empathetic way to get that person to say, hey, you do have the rights and the freedoms under this republic, not a, not a mob rule, because when the mob changes, your thing might be out of style. I can articulate that point where I can still give that person the room to exercise whatever dumb stuff that they want to be on while still getting them to see why they should get back into a more conservative thought process. I do not win that. And again, I'm not talking about extreme leftists that have made up their mind. I do get that person to be a little bit more open when they understand that I empathize on their position. I can just disagree with it. But if the vast majority of my social media is antagonistic, the quiet people that we could reach are going to be turned off by that. We're not talking about pandering. I want to be clear about that, too. We're not talking about, well, LGBTQ plus is the way. No, it's not. No, it's not. If it's the way for you, you have the freedom in America where we live to be that stupid. You are welcome to do that. And I'm, I'm not going to tell the gov. I'm not going to say that the government should be restricting your choices. That's more conservative and liberty minded. Then when that person I start, I have that empathy and then I start to show that person, listen, bro, you are uh, getting a little older and you want to might want to have a family now, uh, whatever type of family that is. What about your fiscal, your situation? You guys make a good, you gay guys make a good living for yourself. You guys are in the gym, you're eating healthy. Don't you want to live and support a politician and live in a state that's in alignment with you having more of your money? If I've already lost that person, they're not even hearing me on that. So if I can't get them on that, I'll get them on this. Yeah, you make a good living. Maybe you might want to look into supporting politicians like the people living good down in Florida under DeSantis. Might be a thing. That person listens to me more because, again, this is hearts and minds. You just preaching to your choir is a subpar tactic. Harriet Tubman, Dr. Martin Luther King, even a more refined Malcolm X understood this. I can't be Malcolm X, the same angry guy that came out of jail calling white people the devil. It does not work. Dr. Martin Luther King said, yeah, we got our own struggles. My, Dr. Martin Luther King wasn't atta- wasn't getting punched in the head and spit on because he was a sucker. He was a gun owner. He did that because he knew the advent of television and showing how black people were suffering at the hands of unconstitutional and racist stuff. He understood that that was a tactic to an overall strategy. And he learned that from the great Mahatma Gandhi. So the outcome, he expanded. If you're saying you don't have the skill set to expand because you just want to give white people. It's like me saying, I just want to give black people the, you can be black and proud. They'd call me a racist. So I can say, yeah, you can be black, Jewish, white, Spanish, uh, Filipino, American, and proud because we are a salad. We got tomatoes, we got onions, we got croutons. That's what America is. We're not gonna pretend like we don't see other colors. That's, we're there to respect the color and the difference. And we expand that way. The other way is short-lived. It is not a good tactic. And again, the reason why the Democrats are good at this is because they have no facts. I'm not, I'm not saying that the things that Matt Walsh tweeted about slavery globally is incorrect. I wanna, I wanna be clear, because that, that's why I went back and put the video out. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm saying, one, I don't live in any of those other countries. I'm saying I live in America. And if we want to expand this thing in America in a demographic that we know needs it the most, our strategy has to be better. He has a million Twitter followers. I got 120,000. Matt, it's an irresponsible tweet if you're trying to win. That doesn't mean you don't have the freedom to say it. Just like the LGBTQ plus dudes have the freedom to say whatever they want. 
Do do is that really going to work with black moms and dads saying, yeah, we want to groom your children? I want them to keep saying that because it's a failed tactic. That's why they're importing to expand. They still have expansion. This is this is this is manifest destiny. They are conquering. They are conquering. We have to make all of our moves equally the same. And if not, if that's not his, his play in the game, then it would be great for him to say that or any any conservative. I'm not interested in winning. If that's what if that's what your thought process is, cool. You won't hear a critique from me. You've already identified that you're not trying to expand the movement. And if that's not what you're trying to do, then why are you speaking out so loud? Oh, it's just for sales? Oh, okay, baby, free market. Okay. I got you, baby. You just selling books. Cool. Then we clear on what it is. But white people don't need to be inspired to speak up. That's the same type of thing that white liberals say about black people. They are grown people. If they read your book and they're inspired to say something and do something or whatever, then great. But they don't need you all day holding their hand because the white man is under attack and someone has to lead them out of the darkness. That's the same thing that the damn white liberals do. Tell me where I'm wrong. I'm going to give you the final say. I've given you the final say because we're out of time. But I I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, uh, I may have you back this week to go a little bit deeper on this. We'll see who, if you're getting a beef with someone else this week, uh, <laughs> we'll work it out uh, right here. Thank you, Maj. Great job. Uh, I think I hear tomorrow, or I will hear tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Look for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving all the seeds when we all want to be free. We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just